Uh, good morning. Um, 9 a.m. form, our third of three forms that we're holding on reopening. And um, still got a bunch of questions that came in, and I'm sure we're not going to be able to answer every single question that's come in so far, but uh, um, hopefully this has helped a lot. Uh, one comment that um, I've gotten a couple different times is, why does it seem like nothing is set in stone? Because honestly, it isn't. Um, we're constantly dealing with changing conditions. Um, sometimes quite a few of them coming from Albany and we're trying to come up with the best plans and uh, to make it work for as many people as possible. Um, in the end, um, anything we choose or decide to do from a hybrid model or virtual or this or that is not going to be um, enough. So those are the kind of things that we want to make sure that we uh, tackle and constantly make adjustments so that we can make this year the best we can possibly make it. So let's start off. Um, so I'm going to start with a kind of tough question um, that, uh, let me just read it. How's that? What do we do if we know a family has traveled and is not planning to quarantine before the start of the school year? Also, what is the school's plan to handle families who vacation during the year and have no and have to quarantine once they return? Well, what we're trying to do requires a partnership. We can manage everything that happens by the time the students get on our buses and come to school throughout the day and until they leave. What we can't do is manage what happens in everyone's home, and nor should we. It's only in rare cases that a school district gets involved, and those tend to be child abuse cases. And I've seen <laughs> way too many of those in my time. So that partnership is unbelievably critical to what we're trying to do. And for someone to violate not just rules that are out there, but laws that are out there currently with the quarantine issue, puts everyone at risk, puts some people's health at risk. It puts our students learning at risk because if we get enough positive cases, all of a sudden we're closed and now we're fully virtual. And we know that fully virtual is not going to be as good as in-person learning. It just can't be. There's not that human connection um, as easily across a screen as there is in person. So my advice if you know somebody who is doing that, is to contact the Erie County Department of Health. The Department of Health has an investigative unit. They are already finding people for not quarantining. And those kind of pieces are absolutely critical. I just hope nobody would put other Falcons at risk out of, out of let me say this, selfishness. So um, I don't usually don't get too serious on these kind of pieces. This is one of those when it comes to the well-being of our, our kids in our community. There, there's no leeway on this one. I certainly hope nobody's doing that out there. And if it's one case, it's one case too many. So please be a good citizen and um, a good falcon. And if you're not going to quarantine, if somebody else knows about it, please report them. So that doesn't affect what we're all trying to do here at Frontier in partnering with our parents in our community. So let's get back to some of these other ones. Started on a heavy note there, so let's get back to some of these other ones. Um, I'm almost 100% we will not be sending our child back to school. Totally understandable. What are the measures needed to do remote learning? Will she have to sign up for Google Classroom again? We will be using Google Classroom. Um, everything we have can be that our teachers create can be put into Google Classroom. Google's actually changing things very quickly and expanding. I mean, the Google Meet was there, but it you know it blew up um, very quickly because of all the other issues with some of the other platforms out there. So, you know, having a device. If you don't have a device, contact your building principal because they're create, helping us create lists to make sure devices get out there, and those kind of things uh, happen. And we, our teachers are going to knock it out. They're going to do the best they possibly can, and they will make sure uh, that 
our students are learning, whether they're remote, in person, or fully virtual. So there's one question that talks about iReady Math. There's also iReady ELA. So, but uh, for the elementary schools, iReady Math is listed for everyday virtual day. It is my understanding from many different math teachers that iReady Math is used for assessment, not daily instruction. It has an assessment tool, but the videos that are embedded in iReady Math are pretty much the same thing that a teacher or Khan Academy or anybody else would create. And because iReady adjusts to the level a student is at, it won't let them go any farther until they master it. So that's sometimes where the frustration occurs. They just can't get past the lesson. That's when it's important for the teacher to step in and to provide those additional resources for that standard that they're trying to master um, so that they can move forward with it. Those are the kind of pieces that uh, are, are big help. So it is listed every day. It is a tool. Uh, teachers can assign specific iReady lessons, whether it's ELA or math. And if you're for iReady, iReady is actually the best product out there when it comes to determining if students at the appropriate grade level or not. Um, it is highly aligned with. Um, well, it doesn't. It's not built off New York State standards. Let me back up. It is not built off the New York State test. They use the same standards to build it, and the difficulty of the program aligns with the difficulty of the, the New York State assessment. I certainly hope they don't have the assessments this year. Um, they, they canceled them last year, and I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put in a buck or two to bet that they're going to do the same thing this year. Same thing with the reason exams, but. Um, can never predict necessarily what happens in Albany. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. If a child's temperature exceeds the threshold and they are kept home and need to stay home for the additional three days until they are fever free, can they just participate in online instruction so they don't fall behind in their schoolwork? Yes, that will be dictated uh, with the teacher that the child has for school. Instead of, you know, the interesting part about having the, the digital piece now is that instead of being absent and calling in and saying, hey, can we get the mix work? Now you'll have access to the work that they missed um, through the digital piece. So those are some critical pieces that it's the same thing like with a snow day. If we have a snow day, it's not really going to be considered a snow day because we have all this virtual digital learning that's available as well, too. So if a student's absent or sick, or whatever the case may be, just as if a student's absent, they're responsible for the mixed work, well, the mixed work will be available for them to, to work on and catch up on and uh, participate in. Let's jump into a high school question. My son's a junior will be attending BOCES. His last name starts with an R, so that will put him on the Tuesday, Friday cohort. Um, so will he be changed to the Monday, Friday to attend BOCES then? That's that's probably what's most likely going to happen. We're planning on BOCES being an A day or cohort one. So one other question said, well, what's cohort one and cohort A? They're the same thing. Um, some people, you know, just because the schedule is A, B, A, A, B, all this jargon we use in education to, to figure things out. But the plan is to have all the BOCES students attend on the same day. Um, we have a, I have a phone call later today, about an hour, with superintendents from around the area, and we're, we're continuing to work through these pieces. And BOCES, Erie One has been fabulous to work with, the Dr. Fusco and the crew over there. Um, I don't know one, any one person who is not doing everything they possibly can to get our kids in school. So let's keep it rolling and plan to attend. You know, with the, some of the times we're talking about, we'll, we'll make them happen or, or, you know, the kids that go in the morning to BOCES will still go in the morning. Um, at the times they do, they tend to be pretty early, so that won't that won't change either. If we said we had a computer available for a child, will there be enough devices in the classroom for instruction use for a child to use when they are in the district or will we need to worry about having them bring our device into school with them? 
So six, seven, eight, we're planning on making sure every student has a Chromebook and they take them back and forth. We also have enough devices that instead of classroom sets of 24, 25, we'll have classroom sets of 13 because on hybrid days, only half the students are showing up. So we will have enough devices in school to do whatever they need to do in school while any devices you have at home can stay at home, except for that level where we're talking six, seven, and eight, where they're truly being one to one, taking them home, bringing them back, taking them home, bringing them back. So you don't have to worry about sending your device in uh, with your child. Definitely not, not a worry there. So, um, and as we get the next round of devices in, whenever uh, they get shipped across, made and off back order, will be fully one-to-one -one across the board. Uh, we have enough devices, even with the classroom devices, to make sure every single high school student, half of every half of the high school students have one. But we know a lot of students already have their own devices. Honestly, some prefer to use their phones for, for work. I don't, I don't know how you type a paper on this, but we have students that like to do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very different world than the one we all grew up in. I've made arrangements with two other parents that will allow us to transport back and forth to school. This will hinge on these three students attending the same days. All are entering ninth grade. Well, accommodations they made for this, my answer is being able to transport, provide transportation or rely on this. I think this is an awesome idea. You're not the only one that's, that's brought this up. And that's really going to be decided at the school level. So that's where making sure your building principal is aware of this idea and those kind of pieces. Um, one other idea that some parents had mentioned to me was, you know, th they've <laughs> they found two high school students that they think are gonna be in opposite cohorts. And they have basically said, okay, we're gonna need you on Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Thursday, and you on Tuesday, Friday. Um, I've also heard of parents teaming up to kind of create their own, you know, it's, round robin kind of child care and pieces like that those are the kind of creative ideas that in this crazy world that we're currently in where we just don't have answers to everything those are the kind of ideas that people are coming up with um, to 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 do what they need to do um, to, to make things happen for their child while also being able to work so uh, yes yes that's you just let the building principals know and we'll do everything we can to make sure that happens uh, we have a question as it relates to access to learning materials such as textbook, workbook to students who choose the virtual option. Will virtual students be given actual paper materials such as textbooks, books, workbooks, and worksheets, or will all material be in electric format? That is a teacher by teacher decision, but at the same time, I'm believing, I pretty much, you know, 99.9% .9 sure that textbooks, books, all those kind of things will be available. It may be a pickup piece like we did over the summer or we did last year. Uh, it may be a delivery if you can't come pick it up, those kind of pieces, um, th that's that's really critical. Um, the one issue with you know changing things back and forth, why digital makes a lot more sense, there's less contact involved. So if you know I have a classroom of students and they're all doing their worksheets and then they hand the worksheets back to the teacher or the teacher collects it, there's a lot of contacts right there. So we wanna limit those as much as possible. I talked yesterday about limiting risk. Is there a lot of risk in doing trading paper back and forth? Well, we understand no, based on the science at this point, but is there some risk? Certainly is. So we wanna limit it as much as possible. So if people do turn, choose a full virtual option, you'll be able to pick up those materials and um, well, that, that can happen pretty well. So somebody had a big concern to the way the information is being sent out. Is the main source of communication going to be via the school website or social media? Our school website has every piece of information that anything else does. So I recommend that people check the website daily to see if there's any changes there. Um, social media is just used as, hey, just a reminder kind of piece. Um, last year, when the year before, excuse me, when we held our budget vote, that was actually in person. We asked the community in an exit survey communication pieces, what do they really want us to be able to 
ad or, or hues or what do they prefer, Facebook into being right up there. Now, I understand that any one mode of communication works for anybody. So whether it's the, the paper newsletters are coming, if you, if you hang out in the post office on a day that the, the, the paper newsletters come out, you'd be amazed by how many are in the recycling bin. That does hurt, but also understand people don't hold and read things like they used to. Some do. Um, some will just, you know, look at the headlines, boom, and then others will read everything word for word. And that's just how that person prefers to get information. Same thing with, with the social media, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook. Um, it's there as a convenience. It's not there as the primary mode of communication. Our primary mode of communication is the web page, and we'll keep that updated as we go. Um, if you, we also sent out the survey notices by email. So if you did not get an email, I suggest people check their, their, their spam folder because it could have came out as a reopening at FrontierCSD.org, and your, your filter may have thought it was a spam. Um, and there's also the thing where I mentioned yesterday, please make sure, you know, contact your buildings and make sure that you, your contact information is correct, that you have an email list of what the primary email is. So when we send those email blasts and such, we'll be able to do so. In the very near future, the district, before the start of the school year, will be going blooms fully. Blooms, uh, for some, some of you already experienced blooms with uh, building principles. Uh, Mrs. Kamiga has been using it religiously before we even looked at using it as a district tool and across other buildings. Other buildings at the middle school, I, I, I know others are using, uh, Blaisdell is using it. And, um, everybody's kind of jumped on it now. Uh, we have that, that is a BOCES approved service. We, we've dived into that. So that will allow you to get notifications from your, your child's building. And we're also gonna send out district notifications that way, whether it be text, email, and that's where our all, all call system will be going to. Uh, we had issues with it last year. We listened to your feedback, uh, especially with all calls as it relates to the lockdown we had in September. So we've been exploring what options we have and uh, Bloom seems to, to tackle all those things. And the cool thing about Bloom's teachers can have an account and they can include their children, their students in that account and send parents. You can actually create a portfolio of pictures and things so that you know, when my little first grader is still a first grader, but you know, a decade from now, still having those pictures when they're little. Um, so that's pretty cool. So, but communication wise, website is number one. Website is number one. And then we go from there. And then also mentioned, you know, the group A and group B, but then went on to say cohort one and cohort two. A and one are the same thing. B and two are the same thing. So hopefully that will take care of um, some of those miscommunication parts. What will happen the first Wednesday since no students will be in school unless there are special circumstances that uh, the first Wednesday that we were supposed to be back. So it's, it's labeled as a virtual day. We're thinking to keep it as a virtual day. So that way any students can that need a device that hasn't got one can get one. That way it gives us a, a day for where our teachers and such can make contacts. Um, to, to their students and, and parents. Um, we're looking to keep that as a virtual day so that if somebody's fully virtual, maybe they can get some those materials, uh, the textbooks and things like that. So instead of making that a one or two or A or B, um, we're looking to keep that a virtual so that it gives us a day where the contacts can happen because on that Tuesday, Everyone in the district is going to be going through a lot of training, COVID training, right to know training, sexual harassment training that's required every year, all these all these trainings and uh, their brains are going to be mushed by the time this is over. And then having that Wednesday as the, the first day of contact with students, uh, most virtually, and then also pickup wise is, is kind of where we're heading with that. Next question, are any masks being allowed? Well, They've got to cover the mouth and nose. So a clear, you know, a clear shield, face shield, somebody can use that, but at the same time, they've got to have the mask piece. Now, the cool part is I know, like with our summer school piece, Mrs. LaRusso um, took a picture early and posted to Twitter this early this summer of a clear mask. So when she's working with students, they can see 
the tongue, the lips, you know, the mouth movement, the speech. Those are fine as well. But we got to make sure that masks are being worn um, that cover the, the nose and the mouth. If my son has a 504, he's supposed to have access to a Chromebook for his work. Is wondering if this will still happen. Yes, it will. Um, that's not if you know whether it was in his 504 plan or not. That access is going to be there because of, of what we're trying to do to make sure every student has equitable access. Also, as part of the 504, we have a parent meeting. I realize this will most likely happen as a virtual session, but is there any way that could happen in person? At least uh, my son with his teachers and I could be virtual. So that will be a case by case basis. That's something that you have to bring up with um, you know, our, our special ed department, the building principals. I can't give you a yes or no on that. And also you have a lot of other people involved that some may need to be virtual, some may not. You know, in a big room that we're in here, well, you can't see the big room, but it's, it's the board room. It's easier to spread out. We had all of our administrators in here at the end of July um, doing some professional learning. Just as we you, you want all of our staff to continue doing, you know, learning, growing kind of pieces. And we were able to socially distance in this room, all 20 of us, 20, 21 of us. So. Yes, but make sure you work the details and things out. That's a case by case basis. Um, we have a question about can kindergartners go five days a week? I wish we could right now. We can't go five days a week right now because of sta staffing uh, capacity and building capacity, space capacity. My preference would be after students of special consideration, our youngest students um, would be able to go most days of the week, if not all. But because we don't have the space, we don't have the staffing. In the first form, I talked about one of our neighboring districts that has the same enrollment as us. But they have $20 million more in budget, and they also have a many, many more administrators and teachers than we do. So I would love to be able to do that. We just we just can't. Um, and I understand that creates issues for parents, especially the kindergarten is coming their first year in school. We have awesome educators and they will work together to make sure our children our our Falcons are are learning, growing and doing the best they can uh, despite this pandemic. So the answer is no, just because we don't have the staffing or, or space capacity to do so. If, the, if that does change because we have a number of parents that choose uh, virtual over in person, that will change. And right now I'm looking at our sheet that showed across the district we have 36 parents who are interested at the kindergarten level of being fully virtual. So that's not that many. That's that's a little over 10 percent, usually around 330, 340 kids per per class. It can be up or down depending on you know which grade level. Um, and I think our kindergarten class coming in is a little bit larger than typical. So I mean that's only 36 students. So you know the, the space and staffing capacity uh, becomes becomes a little more a little bit more difficult to do so, but we'll get final numbers coming up in the next week. Uh, question about lunches. The first form of state of lunches would be in the lunchroom, auditorium, etc. and class would absolutely not be used. Second form gave me a vibe. It is still on the table. Well, what's on the table is not the classroom piece. We're looking at gymnasium space. We're looking at every other space to use um, you know, the auditoriums. It'd be most likely the stages that we would use, not the auditoriums themselves. But our food service facilities people, our food service, Mr. Whipple and the crew are top notch. Um, heck, even during the pandemic, other school districts reached out to uh, to Mr. Whipple and, and our food service uh, crew to ask if we could run their their, their summer programs and, and some of their other pieces. Um, that that tells you how, how, how good they really are at their job. But um, we're not going to we don't want to be in classrooms because that causes a lot more of a, a cleaning issue um, there and also with allergies and other things going on we, we don't want to do that what will the stipulation situations that a student uh, ha that have a student sent home sick from school as it relates to the current covid uh, dynamic so there's a couple other questions on this will there be a situation where you now send a child home even though there is no fever we have 
an unbelievable nursing staff. Top notch. As I said, I think in Form 1, we're, we're bringing extra nurses on for the beginning of the school year. Um, some of our retirees, I believe, are coming back. Um, so that's, that's absolutely fabulous. We're going to have a lead nurse for the North, which I would consider, which is Blaisdell, Big Tree in the high school, and the South, which is middle school, Cloverbank, and Pinehurst. So a lead nurse there to assist with all the, these kind of pieces. So we can do all that stuff managing what's going on inside our, inside our walls and on our property. Those are the things we can, we can uh, affect and have, a, have an impact on that we can control. That also means when a student comes in and might have symptoms, might not, that's where our medical staff will be on top of it and know what's going on. And they're the ones that will make those determinations following the criteria that's there. And that's where we also have the ability, if parents sign up um, on the forms for telemedicine, they can get right to a doctor and see if they need to or not, um, you know, go home or be tested or whatever the case may be. And the test is not, we can take a test with permission, but students are not going to be randomly tested when just because a kid might have a symptom or sniffles or, you know, or asthma or whatever, or a cough, that doesn't mean they're going to be, they're going to be tested and put into an isolation room and all those kind of things. So those fear pieces that we, we tend to go to the worst possible place because we're in a very different place right now. The pandemic is different than we've ever dealt with. Nobody was around in 1918 when they were dealing with theirs. But as a nation, we've gone through a pandemic. Uh, we are going through one. We've, we've gone through a depression. We've made it through World War II. Uh, we came together in 9-11. We can do those things. We can overcome whatever comes our way if we work together. So it, it's not about sending kids home that, that, that look a little flushed or might have a cough when it's actually asthma or seasonal allergies, um, which <clears throat> I might have some of those too. So, uh, so no, that's why our medical professionals are going to be the ones that are on the front lines helping make those decisions across the board. It will not be me. It will not be your principals. It won't, it won't be a bus driver. It won't be a teacher. Our medical professionals are going to, the medical decision we lost up to our medical professionals. Um, See, yes, we watched the first form and it said that parents will be required to stay in their cars while the elementary child goes to the building themselves. We have a kindergarten starting school who rides in a car seat. I understand. Will we have to get it? We will have to get out of the car to get her out of the seat, disrupting your traffic flow. Is this going to be okay? Yes, it's going to be okay. So this is where those individual kind of pieces. Um, it's almost a, it's it's near impossible in this form or any other place to give an answer that then doesn't have something, an exception. There's a lot of gray. And the problem with a lot of gray is that means we don't have solid, solid answers for everything. We try to have the silent answer, but that gray causes to go, well, here's an exception to this. And I can go on a whole diatribe about, you know, what is average. In reality, average is a fallacy. There's no such thing as average. We make average appear out of everything else to make it seem like there's a normal middle, and there really isn't. But uh, yeah, that won't be a problem. And you know, traffic flow, we're all in this together. So I ask that we take our time. That um, you know, as I joke with my kids that. If, I'm, if we're dropping them off in school, I expect them to, you know, get out the door, tuck and roll, and get moving. That's not what we're expecting everybody to do. Don't, don't push your kids out the door. Um, if you need to get out to do the car seat, you know, our staff will stay back so we can maintain that social distancing we need to and make sure they get inside. Um, and I also stand. I, I kind of I mentioned as well yesterday. You know, our, our kids coming back to school, and not just the kindergarten, is going to be nervous. Some kids are just chomping on the bit to get back because they just want to get out of the house. Maybe they're tired of their siblings. I might have a few of those in my household. Um, they want to get away from mom and dad. They want to get away from, they just want to see their friends. But having, you know, the nervousness of going into a new space, I know our kindergarten teachers, I know our staff, they will make sure very quickly that they're comfortable. And 
re reduce that anxiety that's there and, and make it make it work and make it happen. So there really is no flexibility at all. We can't have visitors in the building. It's that whole, we're trying to create our own bubble that's really not a true bubble, but as much as possible, we got to keep it to you know students and, and, and employees. So that's, that's, that's really a necessity. So we've, we've hired a number of cleaners, uh, additional cleaners, uh, expanded hours, every single building. You know, some buildings have, have more than others just because, well, the buildings are larger. They got more square footage. Uh, the cleaners will be cleaning, you know, everything daily, but especially the high contact areas that, that they have. Uh, secondary schools will just be wiped between classes or only at the end of the day. Um, most secondary schools are not doing the every period wipe down. Um, so we'll be doing it two or three times a day as possible. Um, did it, somebody did ask, and I don't know if it's this one or another one. Oh, there it is. Are students allowed to carry chloric wipes with them to wipe down their own desk, even if wipes are provided? Um, well, one, we don't have a supply of like wipes everywhere. It, they are out of control. So if you see any, I would suggest you grab them on your own. Um, but soap and water, those kind of chemicals are, are going to be working best, and that's what our, our staff will be using, um, approved chemicals and such. But if you, if you had something that you wanted your student to come in with, that's the best route to do so. And then as far as it relates to mask breaks, are these at the teacher's discretion? Well, they will be during the day, but five minutes every period is, is what we're looking at. And, the, you know, the teachers uh, will be doing trainings on the first day, but our teachers and staff and such on, on those kind of pieces, you know, a couple of my staff is in, our staff is in the room with me. We're socially distant. We don't have our masks on. Um, so those kind of pieces. Yes, I think I got all of those. Just double checking. Sorry for the pause. Uh, I want to know what the plans for changing classes in middle school and high school will be. I know you said one-way halls, but will everyone still be in them at once? How will we decide where children will eat lunch? All the auditoriums are brand new. How are they going to hold up against spilled food and drinks? Uh, so the middle school, high school, the middle school is looking at staggering, and they're looking to do more block kind of scheduling, not like. 80 minute, but they're they're less in the number of periods, so they, they cut down. I know the high school's talk is still planning on having a nine period day, just shortened um, periods with 10 minutes change time in between. Um, the key here is even if they're changing, wearing the mask, keeping the flow, not being next to somebody without a mask for any length of time. Those are the keys and those are the things we're gonna make sure that don't occur. And then for lunches, auditoriums is one idea we're exploring. Most likely that won't be the case, especially with the middle school being, you know, brand new um, seating and everything else. But there's other additional spaces, whether they're gym spaces, you know, classrooms that haven't been used, uh, you know, those kind of pieces. But those are where the our principals are figuring things out for each of the buildings. But each building has different challenges. Do so. Bless you. See, he's not. We're not getting him tested. He just sneezed. We're not. We're not going to do a, a COVID test on that. Um, as for remote learning, I need to understand how teachers are going to be picked. Is it going to be one science teacher for the entire high school, or will it be one earth science, one chemistry, and so on? So this, and I could read the rest of the question, but this all basically goes to, well, one, you have to have a certified teacher in that subject area, and like in the sciences, I, I was certified to teach chemistry and biology was not certified to teach physics and earth science. Could I do it? Maybe, maybe not very well, because that wasn't my forte. Um, even though they're sciences, they're, they're very different. So your the students, teachers, especially at the high school level, when they're subject specific, are gonna be certified in that subject. If it's English, it's gonna be an English teacher. We're not gonna have a math teacher teach English and an English teacher teach math. That's not the case, but that's why, you know, our elementary teachers are so, and don't take offense if you're middle school, high school, special is because they have to, they not have to, but they are trained to teach every subject. And it's not about the information. It's about how do you 
teach it so the child can learn it best and then know where they are. So um, those kind of pieces. So math teacher will not be teaching social studies. Those kind of pieces, no, nope, it's gotta be a certified teacher in that area. Um, whether you're virtual, I know you said the quality of education would not be as good if you choose virtual. Is, is that only because they won't have face-to-face -face teacher time or will they not be given the same education opportunities? Great question. It's the face-to-face -face teacher time. It's that connection piece. I'm sure all of us can remember um, certain teachers we had by name, and I can go through pretty much all of them at this point, especially the ones that impact me in, in a great way. Uh, Mr. Steiner, still can't call him Rick. Mr. Steiner was my chemistry and physics teacher, Mrs. Eubacher, all the way back to kindergarten, Mrs. Meisel. Um, and there might be one of our staff members that remember some of those names. But uh, it's, that, it's that connection with the teacher. It's that connection with people that makes a difference. And that's what this pandemic piece is gonna be. So when I say that it's not gonna be as good as in person, it's because we don't get a chance to make those connections. It's, it, it's because we don't get to have those interactions and those, I'm sure none of you out there can remember a specific thing you learned, but it's how the experiences you had in the classroom, in the halls, on the field, on the stage, those experiences are what impacted you and made you who you are. We don't remember, oh, I learned, I learned the, the Pythagorean theorem this day in, in school and this was what the class was like. I, I, don't, I doubt we remember those specifics. But it's the interactions and the friends we have and, and the teachers, how they impact us is what we remember those experiences. So, and that's that's the piece that we, we're gonna lose somewhat in the virtual realm. We can learn the material, we can learn the information, but that connection piece is, is the valuable piece that's missing there. So when I say it's not gonna be as good as in person, it's because of that piece. It's, it's that connection piece. You can't connect the same over a digital piece as you can in person, just can't. Same education opportunities um, for some students, they're gonna go even faster in, in the virtual realm because they can just take off and go. So uh, my elementary age child was receiving additional instruction in math and English every Friday because he was a little ahead and could benefit from the challenge. I see high school AP stuff being addressed, but what about the elementary level? Just as kids need additional support to catch up, some were benefiting from being challenged and addressing their strengths. This should be happening across the board. We've been spending a lot of time working on acceleration and enrichment. Um, so it's not just at the AP high school level. It doesn't just start in eighth grade. It starts way lower so that students are challenged. Think the saying that I always come up is they can go as fast as they can, as slow as they must. So if a student can take off whatever the piece may be, maybe it's math, science, maybe it's English, maybe it's social studies, maybe it's art and music. Let them take off. Why, why hold them back from taking flight, to use a, a Falcon analogy? Um, so those are the things, and it's, it's about personalizing education for each student. So technology can help us do that. But at the same time, you know, our teachers are the ones that will, that will help make those things happen and um, making sure there's material and, and learning that's available that's challenging. That's something that, that we've been focusing a lot on and in this virtual environment, um, we want it to grow. Actually, our strategic plan that we have an awesome committee that's been working for the last year, they're just finalizing it. One of the critical um, goals is increasing enrichment, acceleration, and uh, honors level opportunities for students. And that means a student who, you don't need to get a certain grade to get it. Because I understand like in, in eighth grade, I've had students tell me, well, I didn't have a 93 average, so I wasn't able to get into the advanced class. But did you want, do you want to? Well, if a student really wants to, they should be allowed to challenge themselves. It shouldn't be a cut score that stops them from, from taking off. And if even if they challenge themselves and they're not getting 90s, that's okay. Are they better off being challenged versus just going along, even if they're challenged and they're not as successful as they as, as they are expected to be or the norm of having a 90, I would say they're better off by being challenged than, than not. So no, it's, it's that enrichment part is, is critical. 
I was wondering how National Junior National Society worked for, for e either model chosen or any clubs for that matter. So let's attack the club piece. Um, we're figuring, I got to figure that out. When we went, when we closed school down in March last year, a lot of our clubs didn't go into virtual. Our student government was awesome. Um, and what they did at the high school level, they they made things happen, and that's where we can't have students gather together after school for a club unless we can do things that are socially distant. And virtual provides a social distancing. So, depending on the club and depending on what's going on and the timing, those are all individual kind of decisions to be made. Uh, the uh, the advisors for any of the clubs, whether it's National Junior High Society, student government, any of those kind of pieces, I know they'll come up with answers and, and work on those kind of pieces and we'll figure it out as we go, but we want to do those kind of activities as well. Sadly, in the pandemic, well, some of these things may not just happen. Another question as it relates to the same person, uh, will textbooks, library books, instruments be lended out for students who are still uh, to still be able and ban in either model. Yes. If we lend out an instrument, that instrument probably needs to stay with that person. Textbooks, library books, textbooks, probably one on one library books. If we lend them out, they got to go through a quarantine themselves. I think it's like four days. Um, so, yes, it's just going to be a little different and it might take a little more time to change over once somebody turns something in than after. So we got to go through a much deeper cleaning process than we did before. Are kids going to be changing masks throughout the day due to moisture, dirt, sweat? This is where I, I, I would say every parent, get a supply of masks for your child, ones that are, they're comfortable with, because if they're constantly changing masks, um, throw away ones, if you haven't seen, the next, the next crisis for our planet is all the stuff we're throwing away, especially everything relates to the pandemic. People seem to be throwing their masks anywhere, which, yeah, um, I don't know what to say to that one, but can they change them? Sure, make sure they have a supply. I know some parents have told me that they found ones through Old Navy or through other, other places and they have them, they have a supply that's maybe a week worth of supply and they, they get a little, uh, little bag to throw in the, the washer and dryer in. They put them in the bag so the masks don't all get all ripped up and they throw them in and that cleans them and, and things like that. Just like anything else, they're gonna wear out. So it's, it's really about making your child comfortable as possible. And if you have a supply, great. I know it's, a, it's, it's tough to do so. Uh, a couple of my kids go to karate and I've got to remind them, hey, where's your mask? Oh, I can't find it. Well, you can't go if you don't have a mask. So let's let's get this handled. So, if a student is ab as absent, excuse me, my my words are leaving me. On a hybrid day, how will that be handled? Same as any other um, absent day, required to make up the work, do those kind of pieces, and it's really that communication with the teacher that's going to be critical. That's why we have those learning coaches that we just want to know who's the contact, the specific contact person. That's to each student so we can make sure those things uh, occur and those communications are happening. You mentioned that the start end times may be just at the elementary level and the students are in school will also be shortened. When kids are coming twice a week as it is, why shorten the days? Why not capitalize that time they have in school with their teachers? So even though we may be shortening the days a little bit to allow our teachers uh, to make their contacts and do those pieces, what we're shortening out of the day are things that can be done virtually and shorting out of the day some of the downtime. There's not a lot of downtime, but there's always a little downtime. So we can shorten those pieces. So we're not losing instructional time. What we're trying to do is compact it as much as possible so that it's not about time, it's about quality. It's not a quantity, it's quality. So the adjusted times, we are looking at adjusting the times. Um, we got a couple different models that we plan on releasing either today or tomorrow. Um, most likely the times, the start times will all be very similar to what they are now. We may be breaking up the elementaries. Um, so for example, elementary is probably the spot where we have most transportation going on. Because well, at the high school, 
they either drive to school, they have a friend who can drive them to school, or, you know, those kind of things happen. Middle school, not as many kids overall that we have to transport. It was about 1,200 kids, 1,250, uh, 1,200 kids at the middle school. But we have over uh, 2,400, 23, 2,400 across the four elementary schools. So that's double the middle school. So how do we transport all four elementary schools in the same amount of time we transport the middle school when we know we have more kids at the elementary level on buses than not? So one idea that we're looking at is taking a, a building in the south and a building in the north and having those be transported first and then going back out in a very short amount of time you know, maybe half an hour, 45 minute turnaround and having the next two go. So the times may be relatively, relatively the same as they are now for, for pickup, but we may put another run in there so we can break that up and we can also increase social distancing. So that should happen. You know, we're, we're talking about this morning um, as I'm getting ready for this forum and um, working with transportation and talking with our principals. We're hoping to finalize those by tomorrow so that we, we have a pretty good idea. And that means, you know, the high school starts early, maybe the high school, he has to go even you know, 15 minutes earlier, or they have to go to the back line. We're hoping to just kind of keep the, all the buildings about the same schedule as they are, but throw another run in the middle there so we can break up our, break up our bus runs a little bit. Um, so stay tuned. So if the survey comes out, you can wait to the end of the week to do the survey. We should have that information out in the next day or, day or two. I'm wondering why if we all agree that hours of screen time isn't healthy for young children, why Frontier is not considering paper homework as opposed to online programming. Typically homework would be on paper anyway. Why is this old fashioned but effective form of learning not being considered? Well, we've got to balance one on a healthy with risk. So if everybody's handing papers in, and I know what some of my papers look like being handed in, you know, crumpled kind of stuff that we do, but I remember collecting even at the high school level, seeing papers that had fingerprints all over them because I wasn't sure were they eating pizza at the time or chocolate or I, I don't know, but there's, you know, fingerprints all over it. Kids are going to do the same kind of thing. So the less transmission we have of those pieces, will there be paper homework? There will be, but the less, the more we can decrease it, the less risk we have. Is it a lot of risk? No. But the more that we can do to decrease that risk, the better off we are, especially our teachers, especially our staff, um, those kind of pieces. So while screen time isn't healthy, we also live in a world where screen time is a necessity. It just is. There's no job you're going to do um, in this world that doesn't have screen time or people using smartphones for personal use. See if we can take a few more before my superintendent meeting at 10 o'clock. My uh, daughter will be an eighth grader in the fall. She'll be taking Regis Biology and Regis Algebra. Awesome. Uh, this coming school year, we want her to participate 100% virtual. Yep. Will she take these regions levels with other eighth graders or high school students? Most likely other eighth graders, but even if they take them with a high school student, the virtual piece will be, be a lot of individualized. My daughter also inducted into the National Geographic Society, so I want to help that she will participate in these and others. I think I hit on that before. Also, French club, drama club. Um, those opportunities will be there as a virtual learner. We're not sure exactly what they're going to look like. That's why we're going to leave it up to each of those advisors to figure out what works best for them and, and their crew to uh, make it happen. And it'll be wrong for me to tell everybody this is how you have to do it because everybody's got different ideas. And honestly, when you put everybody else together, way smarter than any one person by far please clarify in simplest terms that students do not have to log on during the school day for virtual or check-in they can accomplish this they can accomplish in the evenings and weekends but they need to log on and connect every day with a teacher for attendance purposes if a student doesn't and we can't see their progress then the problem becomes we consider that student absent and not just not absent from the part of oh you're in trouble because you're not attending school, absent from learning, um, absent from what's going on that we don't know about or can we help with and you know every, everybody's going to be having, everybody has challenges during this time. 
And the other question, if you choose the bus for transportation, you are still able to drop off and pick up on days you may be off from work. Definitely. So here's, here's what I'm going to say about the transportation piece. If you know for sure that you are going to pick up and drop off your child every single day, do not mark down that you need bus transportation. But if you need bus transportation at all and might be dropping and picking up on other days, mark that you need the transportation. So if you need the bus transportation at all, even if it's one day a week, mark down the commitment that you're that you need to ride the bus. We're asking people that commit of not being on the bus that they're going to pick up and drop off or walk. If they're close enough to close enough to one of the schools, you know, especially around the middle school and areas like that, um, or Blaisdell. Commit to that. But if you need, if you're if you're talking that you might be doing a little bit of both. Say you need the bus transportation because that way we know we have the highest numbers we possibly would have. But if you if you're definitely not going to use the buses, don't put down that you're going to use the buses because those are the numbers we're going to use to figure out how many routes we need and how much we can space, space kids on the routes. And somebody did ask, you know, what's going to happen if students get up out of their chairs and everything? Else? Or bus drivers already working that as it is, and one kid to a seat against the wall, unless they're a family. Um, <coughs> You know, my four, I don't think all four of them sit, fit in the same seat, but um, they'll be doing the, doing the, something similar. So family members will sit together. You know, the, if there's two siblings, they'll sit together on in a seat just to do those pieces. But we're looking to keep our buses spread out as much as possible. And if a student can't stay in their seat, then that becomes a whole behavior issue, just like it would be with it's pandemic or non-pandemic. And those things we'll, we'll work and deal with. So this goes back to something I mentioned before. You know, kids suffer from seasonal allergies. They go to school, will they be sent home for having a runny nose, sneezing, and a cough, but no fever? Our medical professionals will take care of that. Um, I'm not a doctor, um, not a real doctor, as my kids would say. They've, they've actually told me that it hurts right here. But um, if they were sent home because of that reason, will they be forced to get tested? Our medical professionals will take care of these pieces. I wish I gave you specific answers, but it's going to depend on what the symptoms are. It's going to depend on um, you know, what the medical professionals are saying. They may need to get tested. They may not need to get tested. It all comes down to they may need to get quarantined for a certain amount of time, which then causes other quarantines. Um, it's really going to be a case by case basis. But we do have some, some forms that give you a flow chart of what that looks like online on our, on our website under the reopening guidelines. They're on the right side um, once you get to that page contact testing and tracing those are on there um cup they had a few questions on that one for the virtual option the all virtual option knowing their teacher assigned will stay the same yep will the classes span across elementary schools or be confined within each elementary school that's going to depend on the numbers so right now if i look at say fifth grade i have 17 kids whose parents have said most likely virtual 17 at Cloverbank, 14 at Pinehurst, four at Big Tree. So that's probably two classes of virtual right there across the buildings. We don't have any one building at any one grade level that has a large enough number to be fully virtual. Now with the middle school, uh, with the middle school, you have different teachers teaching different subjects. So, you know, that, that becomes a, a different piece. Same thing with the high school. So, and then if, if, if across the schools, what happens for those kids, will they be able to go back fully in person before the end of the year? We're going to go semester by semester, and yes, they would. It just means we'll, we'll figure out what class they may go into. We may have classes that, that, um, that only have, you know, 22 students, so 11 attend one day, 11 attend the other day. So if a student comes back, they can easily fit into one of those classes that's already established at that elementary building. I've heard a number of our other parents who are opting out of the school district and will be homeschooling this year. Totally understand. Random noise from a phone somewhere. Um, sorry, was distracted squirrel. Is there any capacity to have one teacher who can facilitate elementary level homeschooling, Google Meet, stuff like that? If you're homeschooling, that means you got to put your homeschooling plan in. Homeschooling means that. 
the, dis the district's hands are off at that point. Um, if you're choosing homeschooling, and I can understand why, um, and you know, I know people who've homeschooled and done a wonderful job with their with their children. Um, and some people work together as a team for homeschooling, which is, which is great too. There are resources out there, but once you choose homeschooling and and say that and put a, put a plan in, the district is basically we just kind of check to see if the plan is is happening. Um, so we we can't assign a teacher because honestly, the student is no longer a bona fide student of Frontier until they come back from homeschooling. And that can happen anytime. Um, so, da, 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 da. Oh, screen time. This was, and I, I get this one. Um, so I, I, even in my household, I, I, I get this one. Um, five hours of screen time was discussed yesterday, which is a lot for any young child. It is. Is this the same guideline my four-year-old kindergartner will follow also? It's not about the, the, the amount of screen time. It's about the work they get done while they're on. So if it takes short amount of time to do that, then that's where we're at. Seems completely unrealistic why working a nine hour day plus a third grader attempting the same thing. My four year old doesn't know how to use a Chromebook. This is very discouraging and stressful for working parents when school starts on the night. Do not expect parents to come home from work and then sit and do all this work till 10 p.m. It seems nothing is in stone and it's causing more stress and chaos. I agree with you fully. We're trying to do the best we can. And if everybody does their job, including when we're not in school, that means quarantining. Don't travel to other states, please. Um, staying in our own Western New York bubble, being socially distant, being smart. Um, I'm hoping we can be back to school full time. And understand working parents th that are dealing with this. Um, my wife and I are fortunate enough where you know she's been home with our baby since our first one was born, and uh, even her trying to balance four of them. When I do get home, which is often pretty late, uh, I, I she's frustrated. So I can only under, only. Um, I flash back to my time as as a as a young one, with a in a single family household, my mom working. I can't imagine what that would have looked like, um, with my brother and I, and her working every day, to try to figure all this out. Um, I wish I had answers for you. I don't, but if we if we work together and you know, um, talk to each other, maybe we can find solutions. You know, neighbors, uh, grandparents, you know, those kind of things. It's, it's really our community helping to come together to help each other. And we just, as a school district, we just don't have all the answers. We're never going to. We try, but we're never going to. So um, thank you for that email. And I, w I wish I had a different answer for you, for many of the parents that are, are dealing with that. And I have one last one, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, there's a requirement with sports that you make so many practices before you get to go to a meet, game, yeah, things like that. But with a hybrid model, that won't they won't be in school every day. Will those days they are in school be held against them? So if they're not, whether they're in person or virtual learning, remote learning at home, that's still considered a school day. What's important is they will still be expected to go to practice. So if you have a remote day or a virtual day, you're still going to need to go to practice. So those are the kind of things that are critically important that practices are separate from school days. So if you're virtually learning, remotely learning, that's still your school day in this new newish model to meet the pandemic issues, to get us to you still got to come in for practice. Because if you don't practice, you can't play. Not only the number of practices you need to go to meet, but as a as a former player myself and a coach of multiple sports practice where you put the put the put the time in and make and get better and make things happen in off season those kind of pieces if you're not able to do those things then honestly you're not able to play you're not ready um you're not your teammates 
don't know what to expect of you. Your coaches don't know what to expect of you. So, yeah, you need it. The practices will be considered separate. They are always considered separate, but with the virtual, that counts as a school day. Remote counts as a school day. And how is social distancing on buses to, to and from meet to be possible with students and equipment? Then, well, that means we're probably taking more than one bus. Um, some sports, even in the fall, has more than three schools at it, like we're talking cross country. Yep, volleyball tournaments. Those are the things that uh, are going to be interesting. There's no decision that's been made on um, fall sports yet. The earliest fall sports would start is the 21st. I honestly think that the plan that the uh, New York High School Public Athletic Association has come up with, I love the fact that they're waiting to see how the school year starts, if they can actually start fall sports on the 21st. Um, I think it's a 50-50 chance to, to have that happen. I think most likely, maybe 51% chance that we start uh, with a shortened season they've talked about in January, having three shortened seasons in January going on. Um, that's just that's just my gut telling me those possibilities, but um, those kind of pieces. And uh, I think that takes care of all the questions. If you still have questions, um, please, please email the reopening committee. Um, they're tackling those on a daily basis as we get ready to roll and get things open. And then um, I'll just end it by saying thank you. We plan on having forums in the future, not just about uh, the pandemic and reopening, but those other kind of pieces. And we'll put topics out there for people to still use the, the, the forum page. Uh, I've tried to address every single one we can. I know they haven't hit every single one because there's nuances to everybody's question. Try to hit as many as, as much as we could. And I just thank you for your time and I thank you for your patience and uh, be safe, be well, bleed blue.